that's the last time I'm inviting you to introduce me. <laughs> uh, not even a bullet from the barrel of an assassin's gun could stop John Paul II putting the early emphasis of his pontificate firmly on the question of marriage and family. In just the first five years of his pontificate, he put into place six important initiatives in regard to marriage and family. So we have the Synod in 1980, the uh, writing and publishing of Family Arts Consortio in 81, the founding of the John Paul II Institute for the Study of Marriage and Family in 81, from 79 to 84, almost all of the Wednesday catechesis were given over to the question of marriage in the theology of the body. In 1983, we had the new canon law with an important reformation of the code of canon law for marriage and family. And then in 1983, again, the promulgation of the Charter of the Rights of the Family. Uh, it may be well known that uh, in 1981, when he was shot, he was just minutes away from announcing the founding of the John Paul II Institute for Study of Marriage and Family. Now, of course, the announcement was delayed, but the project could not be derailed. In this talk, I want to look into that a little bit, not just the question of what did he say about marriage and family, but why that urgency? Why put such a stress on one particular aspect of the church's teaching. And I'd like to do that by focusing down upon Familios Consortio to give a bit of structure to my talk. And for two reasons really. One is that Familios Consortio is by John Paul II's own admission a summa, a summary of the church's teaching on marriage and family. It pulls together all the, the streams that came before it, a canon, for example, Leo XIII, Caste Canubi, Pius XI, some of the adocutions from Pius XII, Gaudium Spes, Humanae Vitae, and is by far the most systematic and uh, broad presentation of the Church's teaching on marriage and family. So it makes sense to focus down on that document for, for that reason. For the second reason, that it's the product of the synod of the family from 1980. Now, of course, it has John Paul II's fingerprints all over it, but it does come out of the deliberations of the synod of 1980. And as we know, we have a synod coming up next month and next year on the family. And I think it would be useful to consider as we enter into that new synod, what was in a certain way the product of the synod 30 years ago. So, anyway, whether you like it or not, that's my plan. <laughs> um, we're going to focus down on this particular document to give a certain, a certain structure. Families Consortio lays out for us four fundamental tasks for the family, Christian family in the modern world. The first is to build a communion of persons. The second, to serve life. The third, to participate in the development of society, and the fourth, to participate in the mission of the church. Now, that there even is a task for the family is not self-evident. I think more and more people consider marriage as a private choice for certain private goals. So even before we get into the fact there's four tasks, to point out that there is a task at all is a statement from John Paul II. And more than that, uh, if we're sensitive to the word he uses to express that there is a task, we can see something a little bit deeper about this. The word in the official Latin translation is munus, which might better be translated as mission or office. In the Second Vatican Council, uh, for example, in Lumen Gentium, it says that Our Lady has the munus of being the mother of God. It's more than a task, it's an office, it's a mission. And something similar, I think, is true of what John Paul II wants to say about marriage. There's an office you take on, and it comes with a mission. And of course, this gives it a certain dignity, and 
This, I think, is one of the main contributions from the start that he gave to marriage. He gave a certain dignity to it, and he dignified those who had chosen to go into that mission. We see this a second way in Fabius Consortio because when he discusses how marriage relates to sanctity, he says very clearly that marriage is a specific path to sanctification. Again, you see, that is not self-evident. For some, marriage may have a sort of tangential connection with sanctity in the sense that marriage is a context in which you live. And surviving within that context, you pursue pious activities and on account of those you, you become holy. To say that marriage itself is a specific path to holiness is to say something much more. It's to say that those things which make up the heart of marriage, interior, exterior faithfulness to your spouse, dedication to the procreation and education of your children, they themselves are the means by which the couple become holy. And to say that marriage is a specific path to holiness is again to dignify it. To give you a sense of the concrete results of, of this dignity which he communicated to marriage, uh, I have to warn my students when I teach Christian marriage against Jovinianism, uh, which is an uh, old heresy. Jovinian is the person that St. Augustine is writing against in his treatise on the good of marriage, because Jovinian says that marriage is superior to the consecrated state. And Augustine wants to refute this, but first of all he says, I'm going to write a treatise to show you how good marriage is, and then he writes another one on virginity. Divinianism, therefore, is this idea that marriage is superior to the consecrated state. Many of my students who are formed deeply by John Paul II's students will have the temptation to fall into that heresy. Don't worry, I drag them back. <laughs> but the point is that it's a result of the great dignifying um, energy that John Paul II managed to communicate about marriage, that you could even have the problem of Jovinianism in the church, in a way we should jo rejoice that we have this heresy back in our midst. Okay. Another concrete example of, of the dignifying power, uh, or how John Paul II had a power to dignify uh, marriage and, and kind of, as it were, puff up in a certain way the marriage, that they have a particular role in the church. Uh, when he went to Ireland in 1979, he did focus very much on questions of marriage. And he also encouraged the uh, married couples to take hold of their office to transmit human life. The result was a baby boom in Ireland. <laughs> it's true. And those baby boomers entered the employment market, obviously about 20 years later, and are clearly part of the reason that Ireland had a great economic boom around the turn of the millennium. The so-called Celtic Tiger, is the name we give to the Irish economy, is the fault of John Paul II. Yeah? So a very, very concrete effect of his ability to, to dignify this particular vocation. Okay, let us now turn, however, to the first task. Remember, the first task was building a communion of persons. That this could be the first task, the fundamental task, not first in number, but first as most fundamental, to build a communion of persons, flows from his understanding of man created in the image and likeness of God. For John Paul II, man is created in the image of God, not simply as an individual, but on his ability to enter into communion with another or others in truth and charity. By that, man is able to establish what he calls a communion of persons, and this communion of persons is like the communion of divine persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in particular, when he thinks of this idea of the communion of persons, John Paul II is thinking of the married couple. doesn't exclude others, but he's thinking of the married couple. So, everything he says about marriage and family starts from this perspective. Man is created in the image and likeness of God, he forms a communion of persons, and he is by that like the Trinity. It's a very high starting point. It's the starting point of the heights of revelation. And like all starting points, it affects everything which follows on from it. Uh, it raises, you might say, the bar 
in matters of human sexuality because everything in sexuality is now related to this higher truth of man created in the image and likeness of God. Last year, I was giving a talk about uh, whether it's actually, from the point of view of political philosophy, possible for the state to uh, allow or legalize gay marriage. And after the talk, I had a question. Uh, somebody made a statement. They said to me, they said, I believe that stick insects, these little insects which look like sticks, display homosexual behavior. And therefore, homosexuality must be natural, and therefore, there's nothing wrong with it. Now, of course, I scurried back to my office, and I googled stick insects homosexuality. And there was no Wikipedia article about it, so I conclude that it's not true. <laughs> However, whether it's true or not, <laughs> the point is that we cannot compare human sexuality to the sexuality of animals or stick insects. Because the whole of human sexuality is inserted in a much higher reality that man is created in the image and likeness of God. And if you start in that place, which is what John Paul II does, everything else flows from it with a certain dignity and a clear difference from, from the animal kingdom. So, that's my first point. The starting point of John Paul II's approach to marriage and family is the creation of man in the image and likeness of God. However, not, does he, he only, not only does he come from the top, he also comes from the bottom. Because the other, you might say, peculiar characteristic of his approach is the turn towards human experience. And this is very evident in, for example, his theology of the body that he tries to enter into the reality of human sexuality, he tries to explain it by appealing to our own human experience. For example, the idea of the spousal meaning of the body. The idea that we should concentrate a little bit on the body and our experience of it and learn from this experience about the truth of sexuality. Uh, so in the spousal meaning of the body, we have this idea that simply observing the human body male made for female, female physiologically made for male, we can come to the conclusion that man is made for a gift of himself. This is his fundamental vocation, to make a gift of himself for the sake of communion. The spouse of me and body is nothing other than being able to look at the body and know what the fundamental human vocation is. The fundamental <coughs> human vocation, whoever you are, is to make a gift of yourself for the sake of communion. So John Paul II, I, I would say, uses a kind of intellectual pincer movement, if you don't mind me using the phrase, because he comes from above in revelation and he comes from below in experience. And this is, is somewhat unique because the teaching prior to him is much more a teaching which is trying to use natural law to explain the church's teaching. Now, I love natural law. Uh, I mean, not as much as my wife, but I, I do love natural law. And I teach it, and it's sound, and it works. However, I would suggest that John Paul II maybe came to the conclusion that natural law doesn't hit home with the average person on the street because, actually, of an impoverished education, I have to say. But it doesn't hit home. And therefore, he found another way to come to the same truth. Humanity is much more ordered in regards to questions of natural law. His approach is this approach from above, divine revelation, and an approach from below, human experience. And that's why the theology of the body is a particular, you might say, it's like the flagship of the new evangelization, because the content is not new, it's a defense of humanae vitae, but the mode of argument is new, yeah, from above and from below. Okay, the second task. The second task is the service of life. And in this section of Families Consortio, John Paul II considers in some detail, actually, the church teaching on procreation and education of children. I wish to consider at this moment simply the procreation. In Families Consortio, as in Theology of the Body, John Paul II mounts uh, a serious defense of the church's teaching as we find it in Humanae Vitae. However, again, the approach is somewhat different and it's new because Humanae Vitae considers mostly the procreative end of the sexual act. 
and makes an argument that to thwart that end is to act contrary to the intention of the Creator. John Paul II puts more emphasis on the unitive goal of sexual intercourse and mounts an argument that contraception not only thwarts and destroys the procreative end, it damages the unitive end precisely because it stops a, a spouse making a complete gift of themselves to another. This hits home more because the modern person is more uh, sensitive to the question of the unitive end of sexual intercourse than they are to the procreative end. He also mounts this other argument called the language of the body, this idea, this is particularly his one would have to say, this idea that in the conjugal act, the human body necessarily speaks a language of self-gift. I am all yours, totus tus. And contraception, he says, puts on top of that a kind of contradictory language, because I'm not totus tus. And that's why he would have this sentiment that in a way contraception is a certain kind of lying with the body. But why, why so much emphasis on this question of contraception? In the list of possible sins, it is not the highest. I think you have a good argument to say you can rank sins, sins by the virtue which they oppose. And the virtue of justice is higher than the virtue of chastity. So why such emphasis on this particular question of contraception? I want to now turn to that point and see if I can make some sense of that. Why this urgency in regard to contraception? Well, the first thing is that the contraceptive mentality, compared to the church's position, they underlie what he would call different anthropologies. It's not just a difference in action, it's a difference in viewing what a human being is. So, for example, uh, the contraceptive mentality says, I may decide the meaning of conjugal intercourse. I may decide the purpose of this faculty of generation. It's an assertion that I am, in a certain sense, the creator. The church's position, which is, I will respect and not go against the inbuilt purpose of conjugal intercourse, is a strong statement that I am a creature. Yeah. Two different anthropologies, a creator and a creature. I would say the contraceptive mentality has this idea, the goal of human life is consumption. The church's position, the goal of human life is self-donation. Profoundly different ideas of the human person. One more. The contraceptive mentality seems to say, I can have a personal communion with you, but I can put aside certain aspects of my body. The church's position says, the body is so intimately connected with the person, I cannot have a full personal union with you unless I also include every aspect of the body, especially the generative power. So the details are not so important. What's more important is to see that the disagreement is not purely at the level of some moral action, but something deeper, the difference of what it means to be a human being. So the first difference is the difference in the view of the human person. The second difference is a different view of human love. The church's position is, love is a complete gift of yourself to another. Therefore, when you do that act with your spouse which expresses your complete love for them, it must be a total gift, because that's what love is. Contraception cannot enter into that. But if you think love is more biochemical, or more simply emotional, then contraception makes all the sense in the world. So the disagreement is about what human love is. It's also about whether human love is even possible. Is it possible to make a complete gift of yourself to another with all the consequences that might flow from that? Is the question put before us when we consider the truth of the church's teaching on contraception? And I think actually this is where the disagreement exists with the contemporary culture. The contemporary culture, I think, knows that love is a complete gift of self. I was recently in Salzburg, and I know some of the bishops were. And Salzburg is one of these cities where they have a bridge where lovers hang padlocks. I think it happens in other places. I never saw it in London. Uh, 
I'm not sure what lovers do in London, but they don't do anything with padlocks. What the lovers do is they buy a padlock, they write their names on the padlock, they lock it to the railings of the bridge, and they throw the key in the river. Yeah. Now, I went along that bridge, and I did not find one combination lock padlock. Yeah. But the combination lock padlock seems to me to be, in a way, the modern mentality that you can undo it. None of them were like that. They were all statements of a definitiveness in love. So I think the modern culture sees that. What they don't agree with or what they worry about is, is love like that possible? Can you love another forever? And the contraceptive question enters into that. Can you give yourself to another in the marital act in such a way that all the possible consequences are there for you at that moment? So it's a profound disagreement, I think, about human love. Third thing. We've said it's a different difference of opinion about the human person, about human love. It's a difference about divine love. Because human love is only a reflection of divine love. There's a lovely place or, or a moment in the jeweler's shop where a newly engaged couple are going to the jeweler's shop in order to buy their rings. And in that play, the jeweler is, is the symbol of God. And as they look into the windows for their rings, the window turns into a mirror. And they see themselves in the jeweler's shop. It's, it's a dramatic device. It's all done in a kind of soliloquy. It's a dramatic device to show that human love, as it were, pre-exists in divine love. Therefore, whatever slur you make against human love, you make it against divine love. If you settle for weak human love, conditional human love, you proclaim a kind of anti-gospel that the love of God is conditional. Yeah. So, I hope, you're trying, I hope you're saying a little bit what's at stake here. What's at stake is not just questions of chastity, questions of the human person, questions of what human love is, questions even of what divine love is. Before I move on, I think there's a fourth reason that John Paul II at least providentially focused on the question of contraception, and it's this, that it's quite interesting to look back from 30 years on Farris Consortium and see there is no mention of homosexuality at all in the document. It's not mentioned at all. It's not even an issue, as it seems, on the horizon. So many changes in 30 years. However, the moral structure of contraception is exactly the same moral structure as homosexuality. It's a statement that human sexuality is a personal choice and if you choose to sterilize it intentionally, if you choose to engage in intentionally sterile sex, this is not a problem. And for that reason, I, I have to agree with somebody like Elizabeth Eberstadt who says, if heterosexual persons demand the right to act like homosexual persons by using contraception, it won't be long before persons with homosexual orientations ask for the right to live the privileges of heterosexuals. Yeah, the moral structure is the same. And therefore to focus on it gives us in a certain way the answer to some problems which weren't even on the horizon when John Paul II authored Founders Consortium. Okay, let me summarize where, where I got up to. I'm trying to show that there's some deeper concerns here when it comes to the church's teaching on contraception and particularly John Paul II's approach to it. Human person, human love, divine love are at stake. Marriage and family is like a kind of bridgehead in a wall. My son has recently read a book called The Longest Day. It's also a movie with all-star American and British cast from the 1960s, black and white. Uh, it's a kind of fun movie. But it's about the Normandy landings. And of course, the Normandy landings was an attempt, 60 years ago this year, to establish a bridgehead. And there's a very sympathetic portrayal of one German officer, er Erwin Rommel. He, he was always sympathetically seen from the British side, still is. And he, uh, he tries to persuade his German superiors to fight them on the beaches push them off the beaches. Because if the Allies establish a bridgehead, then the whole war is lost. Yeah? And of course they didn't do that. They withdrew 
the Allies established a bridgehead, thanks be to God, and the rest is history. I think it's something like this in John Paul II's mind. Uh, the questions of human sexuality, even these rather particular ones of contraception, are like the bridgehead. If you lose that, you lose the battle for the truth of the human person, the truth of human love, the truth of divine love. So if John Paul II seems intransigent on these matters, and he did to many, it's an, an intransigence of a man who knows what is at stake. Because there is, there's a war going on. There was a war going on and there is a war going on. John Paul II says in the letter to families, the family is placed at the center of a great struggle between good and evil, between life and death, between love and all that is opposed to love. There are various programs backed by very powerful resources nowadays seem, which seem to aim at the breakdown of the family. At times it appears that concerted efforts are being made to present as normal and attractive and even to glamorize situations which are in fact irregular. So there's a war and for John Paul II it's not merely a fight against forces of flesh and blood as St. Paul says. In the Theology of the Body we have a very short section where he makes an exegesis of the book of Tobit. And the book of Tobit explains the story of Tobiah and Sarah. Now Tobiah is a brave man because Sarah has been married seven times. And her husband has in each case died on the wedding night. Because he has given in to the influence of Asmodeus, the demon of lust. He only conquers, Tobias only conquers through prayer and the help of Archangel Gabriel. Now John Paul II comments on that and he says this, when it comes to matters of marriage, when it even comes to the marriage bed, the forces of good and evil are struggling for supremacy. And these forces are not merely human. So I think this is part of the, part of the urgency, part of the, the reason for this um, uh, attention. The, the other aspect, I, when I sort of step back and look at it, that strikes me about John Paul II's approach is it, he's very confident that the church's position is correct. He's very confident about that. He says, again in the letter to families, the foundations of the church's doctrine concerning responsible fatherhood and motherhood are exceptionally broad and secure. Uh, Stanislav Griegel, who's a, I probably didn't say that name right, but he's a professor at the John Paul II Institute in Rome, relates a story when he was taken to lunch with John Paul II, who was a personal friend of his, along with uh, a Polish, um, uh, author who had just won the Nobel Prize and this Polish author brought along his son and the son took the opportunity of a kind of personal meal with the Pope to try and persuade the Pope to change the church's teaching on contraception saying you know if you do that you'll get more people coming into the church and Stanislav Griega was just sitting back and kind of watching this go on and he said the Pope simply listened very kindly to everything and when he finished, he smiled and said to this young man, he knew personally, the Pope knew personally, many couples who lived joyfully this way of life presented by the church and that it was eminently possible and utterly reasonable. Real confidence. And yet, John Paul II was not unaware of the struggles that go on in marriage. I mean, I have to say, I am amazed at the depth of his insight into marital love. He had a very limited experience of it. His own mother died when he was seven or eight. He didn't have a long experience of a happy family life. And yet, Providence gave him an incredible insight into it. I have been married 17 years longer than John Paul II. And I wouldn't claim to have the same insight. This comes out particularly in the jeweler's shop, in the character of Anna. Now, Anna is a disappointed woman. Her marital love has turned sour. And 
She says this, let me just read you this. This is her self-reflection about her husband, Stefan. It was as if Stefan had ceased to be in me. Did I cease to be in him too? Or was it simply that I felt I now existed only in myself? At first I felt such a stranger in myself. It was as if I had become unaccustomed to the walls of my interior. So full had they been of Stefan. And without him, they seemed empty. Is it not too terrible a thing to have committed the walls of my interior to a single inhabitant who could disinherit myself and somehow deprive me of my place in it? I think that's kind of penetrating. She goes out on the street looking for a man, looking for an adulterous relationship. This is John Paul II's play. She's walking along, a man pulls up, he winds down the window and he indicates the seat next to him in the car. And Anna says this, he indicated the seat next to him. In a while he will start the engine, we shall move off. We'll drive into the unknown, a man's hand upon the wheel. One could lean slightly against his arm as he unfolds the ribbon of the road. Then the lights from above, I shall be someone again. Yeah? It's, it's empathy. It's, it's pathos, yeah? But the reason I say that is that John Paul II is not teaching these truths from some kind of ivory tower of celibacy, but of a real understanding of the difficulties that it can exist in marriage. And yet he's confident that it's possible. Why this confidence? Why? Because he believes in what he calls, in theology of the body, the redemption of the body. This is a huge part of the theology of the body which is sometimes uh, plays second, second fiddle to, uh, to other parts. It shouldn't because this is where the rubber hits the road. The redemption of the body is the truth that the whole human person is redeemed. Yes, we say that Jesus came to save souls, but he came to save souls which are embodied. And that means that we don't have to wait until the resurrection of the body for grace to have its effect in the body. There is an effect of grace in the body right now, and it empowers us to live our human sexuality as somebody made in the image and likeness of God should. You might say, grace goes right down to the tips of the toes <coughs> of a human being. Now, this isn't the place to get into the technicalities, infused virtues of chastity, Holy Spirit's gift of piety. It's not the place. The point is simply to see this. The confidence, despite the clear-sightedness of the difficulty, comes from his belief in redemption. And while he never says what I'm about to say, I think he goes in this direction. To say that contraception is a normal way of behaving is to deny redemption has fully taken place. And therefore, to deny the truth of humanae vitae is not just a moral error, it's a kind of dogmatic error. I'm slightly putting words into his mouth, but I don't think he would spit them out. Okay, the third task of the family. I'll deal with the next two much more briefly, so don't panic. The third task is the participation in the development of society. And here John Paul II says, the urgent, urgent task given to the Christian couples is to fight for the privileged place of monogamous lifelong marriage in society. John Paul II clearly held that human civilization depends upon giving a privileged place to lifelong monogamous heterosexual, we have to now add, marriage. And this is most clearly laid out in his letter to families. And again, we have not time to go into detail, but let me just pick out two points of why he might say that. The first is that political freedom, true political freedom, depends upon the family. 
When the family disintegrates, the state necessarily, not even because it's evil, just because the way it works, enters into that vacuum and becomes totalitarian. When the family collapses, you just have the state and the individual, and the individual is not strong enough to stand up against aberrations of the state. There is an organization which can stand up to the state's power, and that is the family. And that's why it's precisely in those countries which underwent totalitarian communism, it's precisely those countries where the family was strongest, that were able to resist its influences most, and throw it off quickest. The nation of Poland. It's actually the same dynamic in my own country's history, that British imperialism was most effectively resisted and first thrown off in that country where the family was most secure. Ireland. So, civilization depends partly on human freedom, and this is one of the reasons why he's asking married couples, or asked married couples, to fight for the privileged place. Let's take one more example. There's a clear connection between marriage, classically understood, and interest in higher culture. I recently read, uh, over the summer, a book called The Closing of the American Mind by an author called Adam Bloom. And in that he says, the free choice of marriage and the capacity to stick to it, not merely outwardly, but also inwardly, is the proof of culture. Free choice of marriage and the capacity to stick to it is the proof of culture. This guy, Adam Bloom, has no axe to grind. He was a practicing homosexual. He died of AIDS in the 1980s in the first wave of casualties. But as an academic who taught liberal arts in a quite eminent American university, he simply saw the connection, whatever his personal inclinations were, between the need for this lifelong marriage and the flowering of higher forms of culture. He says that in his career, which spanned 1950s to 1980s, right over the sexual revolution, he saw a complete loss of interest in liberal education, in good literature, and in good philosophy. The students became less and less interested in it. And he says there's two reasons for this. The first is divorce. He noted that the children who came from divorced families found it much harder to study classical literature and good philosophy because it was painful to look at truths that were so different from their own experience. The second factor was sexual promiscuity. He said those students who clearly came into university already sexually active, and sexually active in the universities had very little interest in higher things. And John Paul II, I think, would particularly agree with that, because in Love and Responsibility, he says something I have always found very striking. He says, the sexual urge is a natural, born drive in all human beings, and it is a vector of aspiration along which the whole existence develops and perfects from within itself. The sexual urge is like a trajectory out of me and you and every human being along which a person perfects themselves. But the whole of that book, Love and Responsibility, is an argument that this only works when chastity hones, directs, purifies this powerful trajectory. And Anna Blue is noticing that when this doesn't happen and it's dispersed, this trajectory doesn't result in people interested in higher realities. Mm -hmm. So, just to summarize, I'm, I'm trying to give a reason why John Paul II is asking us and asking my couples to seek the privilege of lifelong monogamy. And for him, it's really a matter of justice. It's a matter of justice. Justice has two faces. It must treat that 
which is the same equally and that which is different differently. We know the first, we seem to have gotten the second. If famine was to suddenly strike the Newton household and there was only one loaf of bread left in the house, I must give each of my daughters the same amount. I treat the same thing equally. But it would be unjust for me to give the pet hamster an equal amount. It would be unjust to do that. Why? Because you treat different things differently. And John Paul II's clear argument is that the contribution of lifelong monogamous heterosexual marriage is unique to society. And you should treat it differently from other forms of cohabitation. It's unjust to treat what is different the same. Now the reason I think he wants to say that strongly is this. The tyranny of the majority is sometimes overt intimidation. But often you find good Catholic people who personally don't agree with homosexual marriage but think we should allow it anyway because they think it would be unjust for the minority to impose their view on the majority. So the, the tyranny of the majority can be this very subtle idea that we shouldn't impose our views on others. Therefore, I think this is why John Paul II says, no, 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 it really is a matter of justice. And justice requires you treat this thing, monogamous marriage, differently from private choices for the private good. Okay, the final task is the participation in the mission of the church. In the year 2000, John Paul II beatified Luigi and Maria Quattrocci. I'm sure I said that wrong. But, um, and the, this uh, was an Italian married couple, the first least in modern history for, to be beatified together, a couple to be beatified together. And the readings for the Mass were rather unusual. The first reading of the Mass was from the book of Exodus. And it was the story of Moses standing on the hill and watching Israel fight against the Amalekites. And as you know in that story, Moses is holding his arms up to heaven. But as he gets tired and they go down, the Amalekites start to win the battle. So he has to hold them up. And eventually he has to get Aaron on one side and her on the other side to hold up his arms until victory is assured. John Paul II, in the homily for the beatification, picked up on that story. And he said this. He said, I ask families to hold up the arms of the church so that she may never fail in her mission. I don't know exactly what he was on about there, but let me suggest something. There are, at least in Europe, two evangelizing arms of the church. There is the parish and there is the Catholic school. And I have to say, they have become very tired. This means that the mission of evangelization falls more and more on the shoulders of the individual families. If families do not pass on the faith to the children, the faith will not pass on to the next generation. The mission is ad intra, it's also ad extra. John Paul II again and again said the family has a particular place in the new evangelization to the pagan, to the new pagan. And I've told this story before, I apologize for those who have heard it. This came home to me from a personal experience. I suddenly realized that the family, the Christian family, was like a kind of embassy for the church in a foreign land because it's the meeting place between those who were not going to meet the church anywhere else but in a Christian family. Some years back, we had a, myself and Robert, we had a child who was very disabled. And after the child was born and we got the child home, the state paid for some uh, home help. Somebody came to the house once a month, uh, once a week, sorry, and they would help us with this child. After two months, let's call this lady Catherine. After two months, uh, Catherine said to us that if you want me to continue helping, 
you're going to have to pay now because the state only pay for two months. And we had a lot of help, so we said thank you, but no thank you, uh, we'll, we'll finish it. She looked a bit sad. She phoned us the next week and she said, I have spoken to my boss and it's half price. <laughs> and uh, we felt terrible because we said, well, the thing is, we don't really need you. I mean, we didn't quite put it so bluntly, but you know. Um, uh, but no thanks. The next week, there's a ring on the door. She opens. It's free. <laughs> and what we realised was that this lady, Catherine, she had lived in Austria for 35 years. She had never been in a Catholic church. She'd never been in a Catholic church. It's possible. And. It wasn't so much that we needed the help, but she wanted to come to our family once a week. Because she met, in our poverty, something of the Catholic Church in our family. It became for her like an embassy of the church in a foreign land. Okay, I'm coming into land. What have I tried to do? I've tried to present to you the beautiful vision that John Paul II had for marriage and family. But we have to say, over his 27-year pontificate, while the vision grew in beauty, the situation on the ground became more and more ugly. In the beginning of Family's Consortium, he talks about shadows and bright spots for the family in the modern world. There's no denying that the shadows lengthened during his pontificate. Is that because there was something missing in the doctrine? Is it a crisis of doctrine? I would say emphatically not. It's not even a crisis at a pastoral level, as if some new program is going to solve the problem for us. I think the crisis is twofold. First of all, it's a crisis of confidence. I think we've lost confidence in proclaiming this message. We somehow feel it's too demanding. It's true that to be a ring bearer can be an arduous task. <laughs> yeah. But the question is, if you are a ring bearer, are you called to some heroic mission or just to live your life comfortably in the Shire? I think it comes down to this, and this is why I think it's important uh, we now have this little bit of a debate about the readmission of divorced and remarried Catholics to communion. And Cardinal Casper said recently, in an interview, when he was asked about the church's requirement that persons in those situations live together as a brother and sister, he said, to live together as brother and sister, question, of course I have higher respect for those who are doing this, but it's a heroic act, and heroism is not for the average Christian. I think this is the question before us, and it's really the question that the Synod are going to have to answer. Is heroism for the average Christian or not? It really comes down to that. But the, the, the kind of doubt that is possible it's even expressed, you might say, in a poetic way by John Paul II. Again, let's finish by turning to the jeweler shop. That same couple who were looking through the window and they were looking for their rings, Teresa and Andrew. After they become engaged, there's a little chorus which is done by some other actors on the stage. And the chorus goes like this. How can it be done, Teresa, for you to stay in Andrew forever? How can it be done, Andrew, for you to stay in Teresa forever, since man will not endure and man will not suffice? How can you love somebody forever when man will not suffice? And therefore the second crisis is this, it's a crisis of faith, because we're not asked to do it ourselves. Man will not suffice. And that's precisely the reason why Jesus Christ made marriage a sacrament, to place right in the center of marriage a 
unexhaustible font of divine life. But we are like John de Florette in Claude Berry's film by the same name. In this film, there is a story about John. And Jean inherits, in Provence, a farm. But he's a city dweller. And the neighboring farmers, they want to get hold of his land. So before he comes to take possession of his land, the neighboring farmers fill up a spring on his land and they cover it with bushes. So he has a font right in the middle of his farm, but he doesn't know it. All his agricultural endeavors fail. He has to go miles to get the water, and nothing works. He dies of exhaustion, and his widow is forced to sell up to these neighbors. And I can't help feeling, and I include myself in this as a married person, so often I'm living like Jean, because in the center of the field of my marriage is this font of life, and I am either ignorant of it, or I am forgetful of it. And then no wonder I hobble along, and it's no wonder that so many marriages dry up. Reading the Instrumentum Laboris, the document for the preparation of the new synod, is sobering. Again and again, the problems that are faced in our world are put before us. Again and again, we see the truth that man will not suffice. Every problem is a reiteration of that truth. Man will not suffice. I wonder what John Paul II would say to us as he looks down upon us from the window of the Father's house. The same man who said, man will not suffice, I think would say to us, remember those words, the words with which he launched a remarkable pontificate, open wide the doors to Christ. Thank you.